I know. Okay, we're about to start. If everyone can take their seats. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My name is Don Wolfensberger, director of the Congress Project here and your moderator today. For those of you who are new to the center, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what we do. Uh, the Wilson Center was created by an act of Congress in 1968 as a living memorial to our 28th president, who to this day remains the only president to have earned a Ph.D. As you know, Woodrow Wilson, before he became a politician, was a professor of government and history. He was a, a, a president of the American Political Science Association in 1909-1910 while he was president of Harvard, and then he ran for governor of New Jersey in 1910 and then for president in 1912 and served for two terms, but Wilson as a scholar and a politician thought that both would benefit from bringing, coming together and exchanging ideas on important issues of the day, and so it's in that spirit that Congress created a living memorial rather than another marble statue down on the mall. And so in that spirit we have about 800 meetings a year in these walls, and so we are just one small part of that, as is the Congress project which I head up, and we bring in uh, a member of each Congress, current or former, a scholar who writes about Congress and a journalist who has covered government and politics in the Hill. And we mix it up on a particular policy issue or subject matter and, and how that's really working out sort of behind the scenes, <clears throat> trying to enlighten the public a little bit more on how the process works on, on Capitol Hill. So that's what the Congress project is about. Uh, we are indebted or grateful to Chevron Corporation for a, a grant that uh, has uh, helped uh, with this series. Uh, we're now in the midst of a two-year series on the theme of, of public policy, uh, the media, and public opinion, and uh, so we are grateful to them for that. Uh, before we proceed, let me ask that if you do have any electronic devices, please uh, turn them off as we are broadcasting live on C-SPAN as well as a live <laughs> webcast, and those do tend to interfere with our audio uh, transmission, so we'd appreciate if you would turn those off. A couple of uh, <laughs> introductory notes from f uh, folks in our audience. Uh, first of all, I want us to uh, introduce the head of the uh, American Political Science Association Congressional Fellowship Program, Jeff Biggs. Jeff, if you'd raise your hand. Jeff's in the back there. And he has brought with him about uh, 39 or so uh, fellows for this year. Please raise your hands if you're part of that class. Well, you're <laughs> helping to fill the room. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, I might point out that these are not just uh, political scientists that study uh, Congress. These are people from all over the world. Some are involved uh, as practitioners. And, and health projects, some are teaching medicines. I think we have about five American political science that <laughs> teach political science per se, but we have people from a variety of, of sectors that are part of that program, including a few people from the executive branch, as I understand it. And all of them, after this uh, orientation period, and this is, I think, about the third week of their orientation, they started the day after the midterms, uh, they will then be placed in congressional offices, as I understand it, and uh, be working with members of Congress. So, uh, Jeff, you want to add anything on that? No, I just want to, as always, say that we are very much in your debt. It is a, always a pleasure coming here, and we always leave better informed than when we arrive. So you have become an inextricable part of the orientation of this fellowship. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, and we're always glad to have you here. As you know, today's program is on the topic of the role of minority parties in Congress. Uh, at the time that this was originally planned several months ago, we did not, of course, know what the outcome of the 20 uh, 10 midterm elections would be, although we did hear rumors that the control of one or both houses could flip, and so we thought this might be a very timely topic, and as it happens, the House has just changed control again after the Democrats were back in control for four years, so we have a new minority, uh, which was an old minority. The Democrats are back in the minority. In the, the Senate, the Republicans did uh, pick up some seats, but they continue to be the minority in that body. So I think that we have a new dynamic uh, working with the Democratic president, and we'll see how that will unfold. But uh, as you may recall, during the last half of the 20th century, the Democrats controlled the House for 40 consecutive years, from 1955 to 1995. They took control then in 1995 and ruled for the next 
12 years, and the Democrats, as, as I mentioned, <coughs> returned to power with the 2006 uh, elections. But political scientists and pundits and reporters, I think, tend to focus on majority parties in their studies and their writings and their research for the same reason I think that Willie Sutton said he robbed banks. That's where the money was. I'm not saying Congress is where the money is, although there's a lot of money there that they do distribute from year to year. But uh, it's for, for students of Congress, it's where the power is. The majority is where the power is. And that's why the minority quite often is getting a given short shrift in a lot of these studies. Uh, and yet we overlook minority parties, I think, at our peril, for they are often a weather vane for shifting uh, winds of public opinion. Sometimes they're even a bellwether for a new majority. Uh, they do provide critical scrutiny of majority rule and thus an important additional check on government that wasn't contemplated under the Constitution's many checks and balances. And uh, finally, they are often an incubator for new ideas on, uh, for better governance. So the minority is worth studying as well. In fact, my uh, mentor, Sam Patterson, who was at the University of Iowa when I was in grad school, oversaw my, my thesis, uh, approached me after I'd been in, in, uh, on the Hill for about 10 years and said, Don, I want to do some, more, some studying of, of the minority party because we really have overlooked that. And at the time, I worked for the Republican Conference Chairman John Anderson. So I uh, sat down for some interviews and, and steered him on to some other folks that would be worth talking to. But I think they were beginning to get the idea that there's some, something there that was worth exploring, and Matthew Green today is another example of that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, the legislative political parties uh, uh, really began to appear even before the Constitution was ratified. If you think about the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, that really was two parties in incubation, and uh, even though George Washington ran for two terms without any opposition, uh, the Jeffersonian Republicans soon emerged. And one of the things that I like to point out is that uh, Jefferson was the vice president to John Adams from 1797 to 1800. And while he was in the Senate, he realized that there were going to be a lot of problems arising. And there hadn't been, when Adams was vice president and president of the Senate, had not been sufficient keeping of precedents, any consistent rulings. And he thought it was very important to do that. And so what he did was to compi compile a manual uh, of legislative practice or parliamentary practice for the use of the U.S. Senate. And he expressed the hope that the House would soon use it too. And it turns out that it was later incorporated both in the House rules and part of the Senate rules and precedents. So he did have, I think, a lot of prescience on that. And maybe if I, I'm urged to later on and we're running out of questions, I will recite a little poem that I did on this. But I'll spare you that for now. <laughs> But in his introduction to that uh, manual uh, of parliamentary practice for the Senate, Jefferson observed that it's always within the power of the majority by their numbers to keep uh, to stop any improper measures proposed by its opponents. But the only weapons by which the minority can defend themselves against similar attempts from those in power are the forms and rules of proceeding which are adopted and become the law of the House. He continued, only by strict adherence to those rules uh, can the weaker party be protected from the irregularities and abuses which the wantonness of power is too often apt to suggest to large and successful majorities. So we began to understand right from the beginning that the role of the rules is not only to allow majorities to work their will on legislation, but also to protect minorities and their right to participate uh, in the process. Um, and perhaps, as I mentioned earlier, not coincidentally, Je Jefferson uh, found himself as a nominee of the nascent minority party uh, in 1800, uh, which had asserted its rights uh, in the Congress uh, leading up to that over such things as the uh, neut Neutrality Proclamation, the Jay Treaty, and the Alien and Sedition Acts. So we already saw the parties very much at odds with one another over very important issues uh, early on. But if you fast forward about a century from uh, when the uh, first Congress met in 1789, you go to, to 1889, 1890, we saw a new type of party governance emerging, which I think is important to note. And that was with the speakership of Thomas Brackett Reed, who began uh, with an election contest that he had to resolve. And uh, he decided to use that as a way to set some new rules and precedents for the House. And he began to uh, overrule some of the motions that were offered by the Democrats to obstruct the way things were being done. And then as chairman of the Rules Committee, Reed went and asked his committee to please put these in the standing rules and then have the House adopt those. And these Reed rules were really what allowed the House to come into the modern time as we know it, the, the modern speakership, the modern party system as we understand it, the role of the Rules Committee as, as a way to expedite the majority's legislative agenda. 
But all through this, there remained in the rules, and up until this day, some very important safeguards for the minority. And we're going to hear a little bit about that as we hear from our, our expert panelists <coughs> as we proceed. But I think that's been ingrained from the very beginning as part of the American way of majority rule, yes, but with minority rights. And so we're going to uh, hear, I think, a little bit more about the importance of minority rights, the role of minorities, the various roles of minorities as they try to struggle for majority power. We also have with us today, I wanted to mention, because I was just going to quote Robert Menzies, but we have a couple of uh, senators from the Australian Parliament that are going to come. Are you here? Can you raise your hands if you are? Okay, not here yet, but uh, we hope to have them. But in my introductory essay, I had mentioned Robert Menzies, who was for many years, I think about 16 years or so, in the minority in Australia. But he said being in the minority is really not wandering in the wilderness if you use it uh, constructively. And he found it a way to look at what you had maybe done wrong when you were in the majority, but also to chart a way for your party once you come back into power, as well as just to serve as opposition to the governing party. So he saw it as very much an opportunity and not just an impediment. We're very uh, fortunate today to have with us as our sort of our lead off speakers two members who did distinguish themselves uh, in the House of Representatives and with their respective parties, both in the minority and the majority. So I think we're just very fortunate to have that perspective. And I'm sure that they'll probably agree with the off-quoted phrase of anybody who's been both in the majority and the minority is, well, being in the minority was okay, but it's a lot more fun being in the majority. Uh, Bob Walker, who is uh, now the uh, executive chairman of Wexler Walker Public Policy Associates, spent 20 years in the House of Representatives from 1977 to 1997 as a Republican representative of the 16th Congressional District of Pennsylvania. 18 of those 20 years were in the minority. Uh, he is credited, along with Newt Gingrich, with forging the Republican majority that emerged in 1995 by their leadership of the Conservative Opportunity Society, a group of uh, junior backbenchers who began to challenge the Democratic House majority in a variety of ways. And coincidentally, C-SPAN came along about the same time, and uh, that had a lot to do with their strategy, and he'll probably talk a little bit about that. Uh, when he was in the minority, he was deputy whip under Newt Gingrich, who was then the minority whip. And then when the Republicans came into the majority, he chaired the leadership committee under Speaker Gingrich. Uh, he also managed at the same time to chair the House Science Committee uh, in the midst of all of his party activities. After uh, Congressman Walker, we'll hear from Vic Fazio, who is now a senior advisor at Aiken Gump. Uh, he's likewise a 20-year veteran of the House, having served from 1979 to 1999 as a Democratic representative of the 3rd Congressional District of California. Uh, while in the majority, he has served as the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee for two terms. Uh, he then, uh, in the minority, served as chairman of the Democratic Caucus for two terms. And he also chaired the Appropriations Subcommittee on Legislative Branch Appropriations. Uh, third, we're going to hear from our uh, guest scholar, Matthew Green, assistant professor of politics at the Catholic University and an associate fellow of the Institute of Poli Politics. Is it political research and Catholic studies? Policy research. Policy research, okay. I have a typo. Uh, he's the author of The Speaker of the House, A Study of Leadership, published by Yale University Press this year, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is currently working on a massive project, which I was aware of, and that's why I invited him today, on minority tactics uh, in the Congress. And so uh, he's very well suited uh, for today's uh, topic. Last but not least, our guest journalist, many of you recognize Jackie Calms, national correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, she's worked there since 2008, but prior to that uh, worked for, I think, 18 years with the Wall Street <coughs> Journal, covering budget and tax matters as well as congressional and presidential campaigns. She was nice enough to swap with somebody uh, on White House duty today to, to be here, so we're very grateful to you, Jackie, for doing that. Uh, I, she started out, I think, her journalism career in, in Texas and worked her way up to the uh, Dallas Morning News Bureau in Austin, and then she came to D.C., and I believe her first uh, uh, job here was with Congressional Quarterly, which is where I met her back in the 1980s. So we're just very pleased to have uh, Jackie here. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Bob Walker after we'll hear in, the, in this order from Vic Fazio, Matt Green, and Jackie Calms. We'll then mix it up among our panelists a little bit and then open the floor to questions from you. Uh, you all are invited to a reception immediately following this program. So, Congressman Walker, if you all could speak from the podium, I think it would be a little easier for our webcast and C-SPAN audience.
Very good. Well, thank you, Don, very much, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, when I was uh, asked to speak on the role of the minority parties, I immediately came up with a title for that, uh, for that speech, and that is more than potted plans, plant, more than potted plants, but not by much. Uh, um, because in all honesty, the chief job of the minority party in the Congress is to become the majority. Uh, and if you are not working toward that end, you're probably not uh, doing uh, that which is necessary uh, to um, uh, really uh, fulfill your role in the minority. Now, having said that, the main role then of the minority party in the whole business of governance is to critique the majority. Uh, and um, that involves a uh, strategy both in committees and on the floor. Uh, and it in often involves finding the weaknesses in the legislation or in the process that the majority is, is bringing forward and then using those weaknesses as a part of your uh, way of differentiating yourself from what the majority is, is doing. Uh, as Don mentioned a minute ago, uh, some of us uh, back in the mid-80s began the process of uh, trying to uh, move the Republican Party toward majority status after a long time uh, in the minority. And one of the places that we found some help was in the whole uh, C-SPAN uh, program. And that uh, came about a little bit uh, because I had spent some time on the House floor and in some of the early meetings of what we then called the Conservative Opportunity Society, which was a small rump group of backbenchers, um, uh, I made the point that every time I'd go on C-SPAN, I'd hear from people, that my telephones would ring in the office, or I'd get letters uh, from folks, and that maybe there were actually people out there watching this stuff. Uh, and uh, we decided to use that as a way not only of defining an agenda that we thought was the uh, right agenda for the future, but uh, also to uh, use it as a way of, uh, of critiquing uh, what the majority was doing at that point. Now, if you're a smart majority, you actually give ample opportunity to the minority to do exactly that. Uh, and that's sometimes a hard thing for majorities to do uh, because it usually involves things like a very transparent uh, committee process and it involves the use of open rules uh, on, on the floor. Uh, because if, in fact, you want to find out what's wrong with your bills or what's wrong with your process, put it open to debate. Allow the minority to come out and make their points because they will define it in a much better way than nearly anybody else. The reason for that is because uh, what we tend to do when, when we were in the minority was we would start down through legislation and we weren't going to take on the whole bill. It was impossible to take on the whole bill because, I mean, it was put out there in glowing terms. But if you could find one little flaw in the bill and you could press the point home and just hammer away, and particularly in committee, you could often bring the whole process to a halt just by uh, uh, taking on a particular aspect of the bill uh, that didn't um, uh, appear uh, at, at first to be a serious uh, issue, uh, but could be made into one. And that, it seems to me, is one of the things that the majorities in both the Republican and the Democratic caucuses uh, have found uh, or have lost in the last uh, few years. By shutting down the process, they have not allowed the Congress to work its will. And they have therefore ended up with situations where um, uh, they did not know what was in bills and what could become big political points until after the bill had actually cleared the Congress. And yes, there were points being made out in the public uh, where um, uh, it was being covered on Fox News or uh, MSNBC or uh, you know, various media outlets, but it's not the same as a focused debate. Uh, and it seems to me that um, uh, open rules are uh, really the, the necessary part of allowing the minority to actually uh, help in the governance process. Now, I will tell you that being in the minority is actually kind of exhilarating at times. Uh, first of all, it is a time when you get to think a little bit. Uh, you don't have the responsibility for day-to-day -day coming up with the agenda, doing the schedule, and doing all that. And so you actually get a time to think about policies. Um, and as a process of doing your critiques, you actually try to come up with some alternatives along the way. But it's also kind of fun. Because every, every day you can fight great ideological battles. 
I mean, you can charge up the hill with your flag flying and you can get all bloodied and so on and you come down off the hill at the end of the day, you lose, but you feel really good about it. <laughs> In the majority, the problem is that you win every day, but often you don't feel particularly good about it because by, by the time you've cut all the compromises to be in the majority, you, you just haven't really done what you really like to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, so as a result, you get the aftermath of campaigns where now the, uh, the Democrats are saying to themselves, well, if we'd only stuck to our real guns and so on and done this the, the right way and so on, we wouldn't have lost. Well, that's a little bit of having gone through the, the job of actually governance uh, where compromise becomes a part uh, of the end uh, result. It's also interesting to note that there's probably a huge difference between the time when we were out of power when I was in the Congress for 40 years and a four-year period out of power. Because what we ran into uh, after a time when we had been out of power for 40 years was we had a, a lot of Republicans, particularly in the leadership, who had kind of become accommodationists. Uh, and what they, had, what they had figured out was that if they simply went along with the majority for about 10% of the bill, uh, then uh, th they could um, uh, be a part uh, of the overall process. The problem with that was that um, they had to roll over for the whole bill in order to get their 10%. Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, the younger members, me among them, uh, thought that uh, we were losing the opportunity by having the Republicans come to the floor all the time on major bills, basically being in lockstep with the Democrats simply because they had pieces of the bill. And so the, the, the problem developed then that we simply were not making our case well enough to ever become the majority. And the majority became used to the fact that that was a formula for legislating. For instance, on the uh, Science and Technology Committee where I served, we had one chairman who used to uh, do the chairman's mark the, a couple of nights before the bill would come to the floor. And his idea of bipartisanship on that was to invite the, a couple of members of the minority staff into the room, no, no minority members, the, the Republican members weren't invited in, but the minority staff was invited into the room. And what he would say was, now, you know, we're going to do the bill this way. They weren't allowed to speak, and so on. The, the, the minority staff simply sat in and listened to what the chairman planned to do. And the next day, or a, day, a couple of days later, he would come to the committee and talk about his bipartisan bill. Well, that didn't strike some of us as being a, 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 the kind of bipartisanship uh, that was going to get us uh, very far. And what it meant was that they, then you lost the component of focused criticism because you didn't have the people in the room that ultimately were going to make the decisions about where the debate was going to go. So the criticism piece is, is in my mind, fairly large in, in all of this. And it is a, a case where now, after four years out, the criticism is likely to at least take on the character of knowing what it's like to govern. Most of the people who are going to become committee chairmen under the Republicans uh, in the House are going to be people who served as a part of the majority before. And so it is likely to produce uh, people who, yes, are going to go along with the philosophy that they think brought them there, but on the other hand are going to be um, a little bit um, subject to knowing that at the end of the day, if you're going to get some of this done, you've got to figure out a way to, to govern. Um, the, other point, the other point I'd make is that bipartisanship does not have to lack debate. Um, this whole business of having people who find the flaws in bills actually contributes to the end product. And if Congress is literally allowed to work its will, it has a number of, of pretty good aspects to it. Among other things, it forces committee chairmen to come to the floor and defend their bills. One of the things I used to hear when I would, cr would criticize the Republicans when they were in charge, and I'd tell them, you know, you don't have enough open rules going on up here, guys. You know, you need to have that. I was told, well, the committee chairmen have gotten these kind of perfect bills out of their committees. You know, they are, you know, they are next to perfection. And they don't want to have the chance of coming to the floor and having these perfect bills ripped apart. And so my response always was, well, if the bill is so perfect, why would it be ripped apart on the floor? <laughs> um, 
But the other problem was that it also meant that the chairman didn't have to spend time on the floor defending each aspect of their bill. And that's a bad thing because they are ultimately the authors of, of many of these approaches, and, and it, it, it's a very good thing to have them come out and defend not only to their colleagues, but to the country at large, what it is they've done. It seems to me that governing becomes harder uh, if the minority's role of presenting alternatives uh, is degraded or diminished. Again, I say, the main role of the minority is to become the majority. Its chief governance is to criticize. In many offices all over town here, you have parted, potted plants that serve a function. So can the minority party in Congress if the majority respects its role. McFazio, and uh, while he is uh, approaching the podium, I forgot to mention that I had the honor of serving uh, with him on the Bipartisan Ethics uh, Task Force. I was a staff member, and my boss, Lynn Martin, was a co-chair, and that was probably one of the best bipartisan experiences I had in my 28 years on the Hill. But I, I enjoyed that as well, Don. Uh, that was a very positive outcome for the institution, but little noted nor long remembered. <laughs> <laughs> It's really a pleasure to be here today with Don uh, and particularly with Bob Walker. Um, Bob really did minority well. <laughs> he loved it. He was good at it. It was a joy to see him approaching the parliamentarian with a question which was going to determine how the day went on the floor of the House. You know, Bob was somebody who was really respected on the majority side because he was innovative and he was creative and he was effective, and he drove us nuts. Uh, and at some point, you have to respect the people who can drive you nuts on a daily basis. And Bob certainly <laughs> did that very well. Um, you know, the majority is another thing. <laughs> it's always difficult when the minority has its wonderful, cathartic victory, as it did a couple of weeks ago, only to discover they've caught the bus. You know, they're the little dog that caught the bus and the difficulties begin immediately. But since we're focusing on the minority right now, I have to relate to what's going on down the street in the Democratic offices in the Capitol. And that is something the trial lawyers refer to as pain and suffering. <laughs> There's no question, this is a very, very difficult time. We Democrats are particularly good at the circular firing squad and we always do it after elections that don't go well. The left says we should have been more left. The right, who's no longer members of the body, say, no, we should have been more moderate. We shouldn't have done that. And maybe we should have done this. And there is no real agreement, ultimately, except that, well, we have to pick up and move on. And they're still going through that process right now. People in the blue dog category who remain frankly, need to have a way to express their opposition to the former speaker. And apparently they will have someone, uh, maybe uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, Heath Shuler, be the sort of sacrificial lamb, knowing that there's no way he's going to win, but wanting to, for his own purposes, let alone his colleagues, say that he was uh, different and didn't want to just ratify his leadership. <laughs> You will find others uh, who are simply of the school that if you lose in, uh, you know, like George Steinbrenner would have it, 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 if the Yankees don't win the World Series, well, maybe we need to get a new manager. Um, you know, and, and there is no question there is always that. And yet, um, politically these days, Democrats are well aware of the fact that Nancy Pelosi has brought something to the table for them. And that is the ability to raise money outside of Washington, outside of special interest giving. And uh, while it's great to talk about procedure and battles on the floor and the use of C-SPAN practically, and, I, and I, I think Matthew cited this a good deal in his work, it's the campaign committees and the leadership that attends to them which has made an incredible difference in the last, uh, I would say, five to ten years. I served as chairman from 90 to 94. By the time we entered into the, the, the more recent decade, we're just about to leave, 
the entities had sharpened themselves tremendously. Better staff, better informed, more control in terms of having influence on who ran and how they ran and whether they were adequately funded. Recruitment became incredibly powerful. I don't think anybody has done a better job than Kevin McCarthy, who was just, I think, about to be made whip with a membership on the Ways and Means Committee that he may uh, take a leave of absence from. A reward for doing an incredible job of recruiting candidates who ran as Republicans and in many cases won this time. Many of them actually were defeated in primaries and whoever beat them won. But there was still a real effort to get serious people with <clears throat> public service backgrounds and experience in the public sector generally to be candidates. And that makes a big difference, particularly when you're running against incumbents. It's great to have the wind at your back. Recruiting goes really well when the mood for your party is in the ascendancy. It can be very tough when you're losing support in the general public and people see their opportunity perhaps uh, five years down the road, not immediately. They don't want to run and lose. But recruiting has been incredibly important. They have raised more money, done in valuable opposition research. Democrats did a wonderful job hoping to stem the tide this year by going into the weeds and finding out a lot about the tax liens and divorce agreements, et cetera, of the Republican candidates. Frankly, it didn't do any good in general. It did kind of cause some of the Republican campaigns to sort of hit some bumpy spots. But when the wind is at your back, you can overcome just about anything. When you can elect a man governor of Florida, a state with the largest senior citizen population, who has been a, 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 a perpetrator of Medicare fraud to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, you can tell it didn't really matter what was wrong with your candidacy. You were going to win. And I think it's pretty impressive in that in many states they did that. Now you have to look at reapportionment at this point. Republican victories were not only large, they were extremely timely. And they are doing, uh, I think, it, as we speak, a lot of homework as to how they can cement another 10 seats, perhaps, without even going to the election, by simply taking the redistricting and the reapportionment that leads to that and locking in votes in Texas, for example, where they'll pick up what, three or four seats, and perhaps protecting Republicans in states like Pennsylvania, New York, if they get the state Senate, and Ohio, where they're losing seats to the South and the West. So that's, that was a very important part of this transition, and it's very important as the Democrats go forward to strengthening their political arm as they move into the next political environment. And none of us know exactly what that will be. All we know is in this sort of economic environment, it will probably be just as volatile. <clears throat> the question really becomes for me, what should the legislative role of the minority be? Republicans have been educating the Democrats now for about 20 years. The, the Gingrich-Walker success <coughs> of the 90s perpetuated by the renewed emphasis on uh, retaining power that you saw with DeLay and Hastert, finally came across to the Democrats. Uh, they have always been somewhat divided and into legislating and governing and not particularly good at the politics. They got better at it. Nancy Pelosi organized the Democratic caucus in a way very similar to the way Republicans had organized and won back the majority. And I have to say, in relatively short order, Republicans have upped their game. And they did it by party unity. They did it by just saying no to everything. And I think, regrettably, they did it without really offering a lot of alternatives. It was simply, don't get into the debate about issues. Simply <coughs> stand there and resist whatever the Obama administration or the Pelosi Congress wants to pass and do it in a way that makes clear <clears throat> to your base and to an increasingly conservative independent voter that this was the way the Republicans would govern differently than the Democrats. And it turned out to be a great success. But we have a problem in this country. Unlike the 
Menzies-Churchill debate, we are a divided government almost all the time. Even those 40 years of Democratic majority in the House, I think Bob would tell you we had about 20 years where the Republicans ran the Senate and a lot of bull weevil Republican coalitions that really controlled the floor of the House. We have divided government now and probably will continue to. And as a result of that, we have to govern somehow. And so at some point, just saying no doesn't get it done. Having constructive alternatives are required. Sorting out those issues where we can reach agreement, where we must for the good of the economy and the country, finding common ground. It's always difficult for the minority. They always want to vote no. Bob and I were talking earlier about the difficulty of passing the debt limit extension, the fact that so many of these young Republicans coming to town have no government experience, have taken positions in the election against any debt limit extension, which we all know the country has to do in order to pay the bills that have already been incurred. Will the Democrats contribute some votes to making this happen, or will John Boehner have his most difficult crisis on this very issue? It's, it's really one example of where we must find, at least in some areas, an alternative to just trying to defeat Barack Obama. There has to be some areas that can be discussed, worked through perhaps, uh, to a conclusion that's a compromise. It used to be in the past the, the Ways and Means Committee or the Appropriations Committee would sort of sort out these bitter partisan issues and bring them out to the floor. That's no longer the case. Leadership has sort of taken over through term limits and, and other ways of influencing who leads these committees through the steering committee. They've taken all that compromising ability out of the process. And now those committees are there to toe the line. People who hate the idea of line items being taken off the table, people who loved having the ability to send something back to their districts are now swearing off. No way can they prevail as committee chair if they take that kind of position. And so I look forward to some discussion about what's uh, going to be going on in the next Congress and how this minority particularly might work in this terrible dilemma they have of having their president occasionally asking them for votes that they think are not in their interest in terms of compromising. Uh, with the majority. I think we've begun to see some of that formulation with the Bull simpson Commission's recommendations. The left and the right are taking off for the hills. The question is, <clears throat> can there be a center? And that will be a very important issue for both the minority and the majority. <clears throat> there are plenty of seats. If anybody still... Uh Needs any along the wall here or up here at the table? Please join us. Uh, Matthew Green. Okay, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to do today is talk about uh, the minority party from a theoretical and empirical perspective. And my purpose here is twofold. First, to uh, help us, I guess, propose a, a theoretical way of thinking about the minority party, what they do and why they do what they do. And then second, talk about, briefly in the time I have, certain categories of activity that the minority party uh, in the House of Representatives uh, undertakes to try to achieve uh, its basic goals. And to at least uh, suggest the question, of what, not just why they do it, but whether it actually works. They actually are, do these things and, and they make a difference, a political influence, as it were. Uh, so uh, my focus. Um, well, first of all, uh, the one question is, why am I looking at the House, not the Senate? I'm looking at the House of Representatives specifically. One reason is that most people uh, look at, if they look at the minority party at all, uh, which as uh, Don mentioned, not many do, they look at the Senate, and for some fairly straightforward reasons. As we know, the Senate minority has a lot more power, both individual members and minority party members, especially if the minority party works together. Uh, procedural tools such as the filibuster, holds, blue slip, and other procedural rules make it easy for the minority to slow things down. 
uh, and this is why uh, W. Lee Rawls, among others, uh, have focused on this, and as Rawls calls it, it's part of the minority party toolkit, this ability to, in particular, filibuster legislation on the Senate floor. Uh, but if you watch C-SPAN and see what the minority party is doing, uh, they're not just sitting around doing nothing. They are acting, uh, they're, they're conducting activities both on the floor and, of course, off the floor. And the question is, why are they doing these things if they are so powerless? Um, they don't act in a helpless fashion. And so one of the things that motivated me to do this research is to understand what the minority party is trying to achieve and whether they are able to do so in the th with the things that they do. Now, my focus is going to be the House. Many of the things I'll talk about are applicable to the Senate minority, but the examples I, I'll give are from uh, the House uh, in particular. Okay. So there's three questions that um, I'll propose and that motivate my interest in this subject. First is, why does, uh, what does the minority party in the House actually do? The second is, why do they do it? And the third is whether it makes a difference, if it influences political outcomes. I'm not going to answer all three questions thoroughly, partly because it would take a lot longer than the time I am allotted, partly because this is part of a larger research project, as Don mentioned, uh, that's still underway. And so I don't have firm answers to all of these questions, but I will at least suggest answers to some of them in my talk. So first I want to talk about the second question, why does the minority party do what they do? Uh, and the way that I suggest conceiving of the minority party or thinking about it is in terms of collective goals. Now, I'm not the only person to suggest this. A number of other scholars also talk about parties in terms of their collective goals. But if a party has a goal, a collective goal, then presumably the activities that they will undertake are designed primarily to achieve that goal. And if they have several goals, then they may undertake activities to achieve one or more of those goals. So what I've proposed um, is a typology of goals in which uh, the minority party can be thought of as having a four major collective goals. And I'll talk about each of these very briefly. The first is, uh, as Congressman Walker mentioned, and perhaps the most important, to not be a minority anymore, to be in the majority through winning elections. And this is, to be sure, a very important goal of the minority party. Some might say the most, and some might say today perhaps the only. <clears throat> uh, but it is certainly important in the House of Representatives. The second goal is to influence policy. And the idea here is that even if you're in the minority party, you're a member of Congress, you care about policy. You got elected to Congress, presumably, to influence national policy. So you're going to want to try to exercise some influence on policy. And to be sure, there can be trade-offs between this first and second goal, and we can talk about that later. The third goal is, uh, and these two goals have been proposed by other scholars, such as Stephen Smith and uh, Charles Jones and Gerald Gamm. So this is not a new idea. But I suggest two additional goals that also can motivate the minority party in Congress, and especially the House. The third is the protection of procedural rights and powers. And the idea here is that members of the minority care about their rights under the rules uh, in their own right. To be sure, the rules of the House can allow them, if they're liberal enough, to influence policy or to try to win elections. But they're also important in their own right. You get elected to Congress, you're representing over 600,000 people. You care about uh, your rights as a member of Congress. And the fourth goal that I suggest is internal party unity. Now, this one is maybe a little less uh, persuasive a case because one could argue really Unity is a means to achieve an end, such as winning on the floor or winning elections. But I would argue that in many cases, the minority party seeks to be unified, uh, either, because, either in ways they can't quite say exactly, they're not sure how it's going to achieve future goals, but it's something that's important, uh, or it achieves other things that matter to minority party leaders. For instance, they don't have to worry about dealing with open defections on the floor or press coverage of the divided minority. If their party's unified, they can focus less on building uh, discipline or discipline to build uh, uh, unity and instead focus on other things as well. And as I show here in the chart, there are uh, four different basic strategies that a minority party can undertake to achieve one or more of these goals. Campaign-related activity, position-taking, activity in the public sphere is the second legislating and obstruction. So what I thought I'd do is very briefly talk about some examples of each of these four categories and then sum up. Well, the first activity is campaign related. And of course, a lot of things that members of Congress do can be focused on campaigns or, or elections. So what I mean here is activity that is primarily or principally focused on election activity and winning elections. So two examples I'll mention briefly. 
The first is candidate recruitment, which is very important for uh, the minority party, for either party, frankly, to get people to run for office, to challenge members of the other party, or to run for open seats. Now, in the paper that I wrote for this talk, uh, for this panel, I talk about one way of measuring the success of recruitment, which is the quality of candidates. Another way, which uh, is not in the paper, is just looking at how many people you get to run uh, from your party against the majority party. And this is data that was compiled by Nate Silver, the blogger who's currently affiliated with the New York Times, that shows the number of House seats held by each party that were uncontested. Notice, if you will, the difference on the top bar, which is the number of uh, Democrats who did not face a challenger, the difference between 2008 and 2010. Republicans successfully got almost every House incumbent uh, this year to face a challenger. And that means, to be sure, not all of these challengers may be of high quality, but that puts pressure on the majority party to fund those candidates, to, uh, to put up some degree of defense against those incumbents, and so forth. And contrast on the bottom chart with the number of Republicans who did not face challengers. And the Democrats did worse compared to 2008 in finding people to run against incumbent Republicans. So candidate uh, recruitment is very important. Of course, it is difficult to, to know for sure the relative role of party leaders uh, and campaign uh, folks doing campaigns for the minority versus other factors. As Congressman Fazio mentioned, uh, when the wind is at your back, recruitment is a whole lot easier. And there have been stories and reports of, for example, Congressman McCarthy telling the press that there was some difficulty recruiting members until of uh, uh, Republicans to run for Congress until two things happened. One was Scott Brown won a special election in Massachusetts. And number two was the enactment of the health care bill. All of a sudden, all these Republicans came out of the woodwork saying, I want to run for Congress, either because I think I can win and or I'm really unhappy with Obama and I don't want to see the Democrats in charge in Congress anymore. So separating these two is difficult. But to be sure, it is important, I think, at a minimum for the minority party to be putting in efforts at candidate recruitment. Second, very briefly, I'll mention is fundraising. And in the paper, I talk about overall fundraising by the DCCC, uh, as well as the Republicans. And I also look at how well the Democrats raised money for special candidates they targeted in 2006. So this is when they were in the minority in the so-called Red to Blue program. And this chart shows how well Red to Blue members uh, raised money, this is the green bar, in the quarter before they were put on the list and then the quarter after they were put on the list, compared with in the red, members from roughly similar districts who are running, Democrats, and then the blue is just a random assortment of members, uh, Democrats who are running. Sure enough, uh, red to blue members, uh, candidates were already raising a lot of money, but they continued to raise a lot of money after they were put on the red to blue list, whereas other uh, lawmakers may have also raised more, but nowhere near the exact amounts or the same dollar amounts as those on the red to blue list. And the same thing happened for the second round of those Democrats added to the red to blue program in uh, July of 2006. Again, the green bar shows they raised significantly more in the second in the quarter after they were put on the list as opposed to uh, members from similar districts. Democrats were also running. Okay. Very quickly, the other three spheres that I look at, legislating. This is a large and complicated uh, sphere. A lot of ways the minority party can influence legislation in theory. I look at amending on the floor and surprise, surprise, minority party members tend not to have much success in influencing legislation on the floor unless at least two things happen. One, they're offering an amendment that's relatively minor or non-controversial, or they can command a pivotal majority of members. They can get enough members of the majority party to vote with them. This has been particularly the case on uh, campaign finance legislation in recent decades. Uh, but the caveat here is that, as I just said, there's a lot of other ways to influence legislation. A lot of legislation might reflect minority party interests before it's introduced or in committee. <laughs> and of course, if the minority party has, uh, if their party controls the Senate or, and or the White House, then they have more leverage. So uh, it is possible for the minority party to influence policy, but just the strict amending process, it's relatively difficult. <laughs> Last two spheres of activity. Public position taking, and the example that I'll discuss here is election year uh, agendas, alternative agendas. One could argue this is really more election activity, but I think it's a little bit more removed from raising money or recruiting candidates. So I look at um, things such as the contract with America, a new direction for America, the pledge to America, 
minority parties suggesting what they would do if they took control of uh, the House of Representatives. Two quick points I want to make about this. Uh, Contract of America was very important uh, and in many ways influenced what minority parties would do after that. But we shouldn't forget that this was not the first time a minority party tried to offer an alternative agenda. Uh, for instance, Congressman John Rhodes, who was the leader of the Republican minority in the 1970s, uh, after the devastating 1974 election when the Republicans lost a massive number of seats, he got his colleagues together and they drafted their own alternative agenda and then he publicized it in a book he wrote in, that was published in 1976 called The Futile System. So this was not the first time, 1984 is not the first time we've seen minority parties try to do this. Second larger point, there's not a whole lot of evidence that these uh, have at least helped the minority achieve their electoral goals for a number of reasons. Uh, polls have shown that, uh, as Don Wolfensberger has noted in his book, uh, most voters don't really know about these things. It's not clear they vote based on wh how, what, these, what these agendas say. Voters tend to be retrospective, so they judge the party in power rather than prospective, what they think the other party will do. Um, so at least in terms of influencing elections, these don't seem to have a whole lot of influence. Although I think they can play an important role in other ways, which I can talk about uh, further if people are interested. Fourth and final category is dilatory or obstructionist tactics. This is where the Senate gets all the attention, right? filibuster and all this stuff. But the rules in the House still allow the minority to at least pester the majority, slowing things down here and there. And the example that I give here are motions to rise and or adjourn, which if they pass, interrupt the legislative process. And even if they don't, they require a recorded vote or usually are, uh, are decided by a recorded vote, which is another 15 or 20 minutes of legislative time that's consumed with these motions to basically stop what we're doing right now. Uh, the most famous example of this in recent years is probably the, uh, in 2008, when Congressman Tom Lantos passed away. There was a memorial service for him. The House went into session for some unclear reason, and they were considering some uh, resolutions the minority Republicans didn't like. Congressman Lincoln diaz Ballard offered a motion to adjourn, and so there was all this hullabaloo, how dare you do this while we're having a memorial service, well, how dare you have the House in session while we're having memorial service, and back and forth and back and forth. That's not the only time, though, that the minority party has done this. Very quickly, this graph shows the percentage of recorded votes in the House that have been cast on motions to rise and or adjourn. You can see that as a total, in terms of a percentage of all roll call votes, it's low. It's less than 6% uh, and oftentimes much less. And there's a lot of fluctuation. But I think what's most interesting about this chart is how these were very rare until the 1990s. And now it's seen as a potential for minority parties, a potential tool to offer a lot of motions to rise and adjourn. Of course, these are most effective when they are used uh, more than once. This is the percentage of motions to rise or adjourn offered by the minority party that occur within one day of each other. And you can see that now we see these pretty routinely, about 80% of motions to rise or adjourn are done over uh, at least two times over the course of two days and often many, many times. Now, caveat here, sometimes this is just one member of Congress with some personal grudge who offers them five, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 times. Gene Taylor of Mississippi did this once or something that bugged him. So it's not necessarily a good sign of the minority party's concerns or their objections. So this shows the percentage, the average percentage of the minority party that actually votes for these motions to rise or adjourn. And you can see, again, a great deal of fluctuation. I think most interesting here is the difference between the last Congress, the 110th, and this Congress. So in 2007, 2008, Republicans were offering a lot of motions to rise and adjourn, and most of the party was supporting them. This Congress, not only were there fewer, but hardly anybody was supporting them. And we can talk about some reasons why, but one reason I think is the case from my discussions uh, with folks who work in the minority leadership uh, is that there was a decision after 2008 that these things didn't work. They weren't helping the minority achieve their goals. And so they were abandoned both in number and in uh, the frequency with which members would, would support them. Last chart on this, and then I'll quickly wrap up. The other way to think about these, or to understand why they're done, is to look at why the people who offer them, what their justification is. Why are you offering a motion to rise or adjourn? Uh, most of the reasons are not too surprising, and most of them can be connected to one of these four goals that I mentioned. I think what was most interesting to me about this was the percentage of these offered by members who are upset at the agenda as they wanted some other bill to be considered on the floor. Now this is not a power the minority party has to change the agenda. 
And so it's interesting that they would be doing this out of protest. Either they really thought they could change the agenda and wanted to, uh, or it was a way of highlighting their agenda to the broader public. So to conclude, uh, the minority party is not irrational. The things they do have a purpose. It's often to get become the majority, but not always. And I would say that some of these tactics can work to some extent in helping the party achieve some of their goals. A few general things that I think matter for the minority party. Resources, the minority party, if they have money, if they have talent, if they have individuals who are entrepreneurial, that can help them achieve, at least uh, do these, uh, execute these strategies well. If they have pivotal status, they can win over members of the majority party on the floor. Can they command attention? Can they get the press to pay attention to what they're doing? And finally, the goodwill of the majority, which Congressman Walker mentioned, smart majorities uh, give the minority opportunities. And so one could argue. Please turn off your electronic devices if you have a uh, cell phone or Blackberry. Well, that might also be a cue for me to stop. Uh, so very quickly, <laughs> right, it's, sometimes majority, minorities have influence because the minority gives them that. We don't see it so often now in the aggregate, but sometimes in individual pockets of politics on the House we do. Uh, and that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Just one thing that I noticed, and I'm probably one of the few wonky people outside of the Hill that looks at special rules, but the majority began writing into these special rules for bills, these uh, that lay down the procedures, prohibitions now on anybody offering a motion to rise. So now only the chairman of the committee can do that, so that's why you're seeing a lot fewer of those motions. With that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Jackie Calms. Jackie, uh, as I may, may have mentioned at the outset, has had the benefit not only of covering Congress for Congressional Quarterly when she first came, but covering uh, budgetary uh, and appropriations matters, but also covering a number of campaigns, both congressional and presidential. So uh, I think she could give us some perspective, too, on uh, how some of this stuff is perceived outside the Beltway and on the campaign trail. I, um, it's sort of appropriate I'm here at the time of another turnover because when I first started covering Congress, it was 1984, um, and uh, I actually thought, as year after year went on, that I would never cover a Congress that had a um, Republican House majority. Seriously, I never thought in my career I would see that. And in 92, oh, wait, there was a group in around the late 80s, early 90s called the 92 Group of House Republicans, and their name suggests their goal. They were going to win a majority, and we're all going, yeah, right. And of course, they didn't, but they were actually, the seeds were planted that year for the midterm election, just like we've got now, where the uh, party in power, the party that held the White House, when you <coughs> you know, typically, but not always, lose seats in a midterm, and Newt Gingrich, and I'm sure you too, Bob, were knew that you would gain seats in 94. In fact, um, the uh, statute of limitations is, is passed on this. I can say that in um, uh, 88, I have to, I'm going so far back now, I even I have to think, that Newt Gingrich did not want George H.W. Bush um, to get the presidency, uh, no, this was in 91. He didn't want him to win it again in 92 because he saw that in 94 there could be, be big gains in the midterms. Um, so, but I actually think it was, I was glad, you know, all <coughs> party <coughs> considerations aside, I thought it was bad for any one party to hold control of the House for four decades with an unbroken uh, stretch and that you saw the results and what was happening within the House Democratic Caucus. It was, there was, you know, there, there were some practices taking hold, a sense of entitlement that was corrupting. Um, so then, you know, when the Democrats, they thought, uh, and right before this, by the way, it wasn't just the 92 group that was, uh, we thought was delusional. There was a, a couple of moderate Republican uh, political scientists who wrote a book, and I think it was 91, called The Permanent Minority. Do you remember that? 94. That's what it, it came out in 94, but it had a right. question mark just in, in a timely way at the <laughs> uh, end of it. It was, right. it was the permanent Republican minority. <laughs> right. Right. And along those same lines, two friends of mine actually wrote a book in the mid-decade uh, mid just we just uh, finished that was about 
the permanent Repub the domination of Republicans um, for years to come, and then that was right before 2006, which is makes me glad I never um, get the urge to write a book uh, <laughs> like that, or at least not one that uh, can be proven false in the next uh, election. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> but the minorities that so it's been a great experience now to see this swing back and forth. Um, in 95, arguably, the uh, Republicans overreached, just as Democrats are having been accused of doing now. I think there was an even a bigger argument for the Repu House Republicans overreaching in, in 95. And partly it goes to what Bob said about the difference then versus now, which is that there's a big, the, the, what I saw happen in, in 95 is that you had uh, House Republicans, in, and including the chairman, who had no idea, really, it seemed, how, how to govern, how to be a majority. And a lot of them, well, at least some of them, had just about become, they were literal pot of plants in their, their uh, committees. I'll give you one example for a committee I watched really closely was House Ways and Means and Bill Archer. He had just been, both by the Democrats' domination and his own inclination, just took himself out of any role whatsoever in that committee. So in January of 1995, I remember chasing after him after he had just made an announcement right after they took power that he was the Ways and Means Committee was going to cut something on the scale of 245 billion out of Medicare in a, in five years, and something I just thought was not possible, and um, so it quickly became obvious. And and the thing was, Newt Gingrich couldn't check him either because Newt Gingrich had never been much involved in policy, so um, I think the the budget. Uh, breakdown later that year proved um, that they they were wrong. Uh, I remember I, my colleague, when I was, I was covering Congress then for the Wall Street Journal, and my colleague day in and day out on the Hill was David Rogers, who is arguably the best and longest serving congressional reporter ever. Uh, he's now at Politico. And he and I were always like, getting angry because we were getting these vibes and indirectly hearing from uh, the mothership in New York that we just didn't get it, that there was a revolution going on and our, our stories weren't reflecting what was happening. And David and I were just, because we had been around in the nitty gritty of politics since, well, me since 1984, David since 1979, and we just knew that they couldn't do, I mean, you can never be sure, but we sure couldn't see how they were going to be able to do what they had promised they could do. Um, so I think it's a good thing now that if, you know, they're taking over at a time when their memories are, short, are, are so um, recent as to, to how to be a majority, but I think in a lot of ways they seem to be taking the message that they have a mandate that I don't see, and I, my duty on election night was to write the exit poll story, and those exit polls, more than most, were just full of mixed messages, you know, and there was, um, you know, a big four out of ten voters said they wanted more spending, not deficit reduction or um, tax cuts. There was a big, uh, uh, about the same percentage, I should have reviewed the numbers before I came in here, said that, um, well, there was a majority, it was about 52 percent when you combine the number who said they didn't want any of the Bush tax cuts to be extended and those who wanted just the middle class extended, which, you know, left, leaves a minority to do what the Republican majority now wants to do. Um, the, uh, so I think the other thing that I'm, I'm really interested in watching, you know, every, every time is different. What I'm really interested now in watching is how these Republicans deal with um, something, you know, I'm used to watching Congress as an institution that's very uh, inward driven. I mean, the members themselves have external pressures, but it's a very, uh, there's a lot of just internal, in, internalize and institutional factors that come into play, in part because the public isn't paying that close attention. But I have never seen uh, a situation or an environment where the majority party in Congress is going to be so um, watched over by a group, of, and that, of course, is the Tea Party and people who are sympathetic to what they stand for. And they have been very blunt in saying, you know, we are not Republicans, uh, we happen to, you know, share a lot in common with Republicans, and if they don't, you know, if they don't do what um, they've promised us they'll do, then there will be trouble. Um, the, 
uh, one thing as a reporter, I think, is that another healthy thing, and again, it's all policy and partisanship aside, is the extent to which when you're in the minority, and in particular, uh, especially in the House, and, and I think <coughs> we're most, we're just talking about the House here, um, the, we in the press don't pay any attention to them, next to none, especially when you have an agenda as active uh, an activist as the Democrats have had, both by necessity and by inclination, for the past two years. And I'll give you just one example that shows what's really sort of a benefit of having divided government from a journalist standpoint. There's been a lot of things said by Republicans over the last two years that if we had the time and if our editors had the interest, we could write and say, well, it's not quite right. You know, this is, this is rhetoric, this isn't, there's, it's not really fact-based. But like I say, there's just no appetite or time for it. And, but recently, um, I was going over the list of uh, the proposed cuts to see where Republicans, you know, to try to figure out where this promised $100 billion in domestic discretionary cuts would come from. And one of the largest cuts on their list is $25 billion by um, repealing, a $25 billion savings over 10 years by repealing a, wealth, a particular welfare program. So I looked at it, and it turns out this welfare program, $2.5 billion a year, was actually part of the stimulus program, a two-year program, $2.5 billion divided over two years. Uh, now, in, to be fair, the Republicans, I mean, Democrats in the House did try to extend it for a year or two because unemployment remains at 10 percent, and this particular uh, uh, welfare program was <coughs> aimed at long-term jobless families. Um, but they failed. Uh, Republicans blocked it. And in any case, so the program died September 30th. You cannot balance the budget by getting rid of programs that don't exist. So now, normally, I would just laugh and say, oh, my God, you know, roll my eyes. But now that they are a majority and I'm trying to figure out where they're going to cut, I mean, that would have been one-fourth, well, no, because 100 billion is the amount they're talking for one year, so this 25 billion. What they did, obviously, was take 2.5 billion, multiply by 10, and that's 25 billion in 10-year savings. So I wrote about it. I would never have written about that for the past two years, even though, you know, things like that have been out there. And I think that's good. And I, I called the I called the chief, the Republican leadership staffer, and I asked, you know, what, how, can you justify this? Why did you propose this as saving that much money? And he said, well, just like you said, the Democrats did try to extend it. And I said, yeah, and they failed. So let's, when, when you're in the majority, just try getting CBO to score that for you. <laughs> um, the one, the, one of the questions um, Don asked us to look at was whether reapportionments, and I thought I'd address this since it's coming up, um, first time I covered reapportionment was 1981 in the Texas legislature when it was still a one-party democratic state and the Republicans were just starting to make inroads, but and then in 1982 they would lose every statewide seat, but that was the last time, uh, that was the last hurrah for Democrats in Texas. But um, the, the question is whether it will, um, whether the talk of the importance of computer manipulated district lines to the advantage of one party over the other is overblown. And I would say absolutely not, ex with the caveat that a wave election can undo the best, most precise computer redistricting and, and re gerrymandering as we saw in 1994, 2006, and now 2010. But the fact is that the combination of redistricting, which has segregated the wings of both party into so many districts, except perhaps for you know two or three dozen, together with the realignment, political realignment in our country over, over since the civil rights era, has made I think the prospect of more of these uh, turnover elections for the House more common, for better and worse. Um, you have you know the the House Republicans are are the most conservative of conservatives, as just as the Democrats, except when they have a big influx of moderates from a wave election, you know, the combination of 2006 and 2008, a lot of members that even they were saying didn't really deserve to hold, or didn't really, you know, 
wouldn't have a long hold on the seats because they were just too Republican leaning. But you, so you get this situation where you have the wings of each party in these districts. They're virtually one party districts. And then the activists are, are looking closely at what they do and they have high expectations. And when the the party that's the majority doesn't meet those expectations, isn't liberal enough or isn't conservative enough, they get depressed and a midterm election comes along with no presidential candidates at the top to bring voters out and the activists who are uh, for the majority who has disappointed them, they stay home, a lot of them. Uh, and conversely, the minority voters get energized and they come out. You know, we saw that happen in 94 to the disadvantage of the Democrats, again in 2006 to the disadvantage of the Republicans, and now in 2010 once again to the disadvantage of Democrats. So I think we're in, you know, very much the opposite of what I first expected when I started my career where I'd never see a Republican majority. I think I'm seeing a, a Republican majority now for the second time, and I think I'll see them in the minority again before my career is over especially since I'm going to be working long past 65 because I won't be able to afford retirement. <laughs> um, I, would just, um, I would just close with uh, one thing. Um, you know, and, and I have to say, when, when I first got to know Bob Walk, I had to say, when he was in the House and he and Gingrich and Conservative Opportunity Society, I was really... Um, I really didn't like what I thought they represented because I thought there should be some more accommodation. Um, but I've, I've come a little bit closer to where he is just as a citizen um, because when I start, another thing that's very much changed, and I'm sort of riffing here, so I apologize and I'll sit down and so you can have your questions, but when I first started my <coughs> career, the truism was there's not a dime's worth of difference, there's no daylight between the two parties. I mean, think about that. Nobody would say that now. Um, I don't think they would. Uh, well, some big people in the way fringe. The Green parties. Party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, I think, so I think it is good, but I think we are in danger or we've already taken it too far. And I'm going to go out on a limb at the risk of sounding like I'm expressing an opinion. If there's one time I think people should accommodate each other, it's in times of national crisis. I think the uh, period from late 2008 to early 2009 was just such a period. Um, and I just want to give four examples as to where I think the Republicans did not uh, accommodate or at least try to. You can, and we can all stipulate that the Democrats didn't go far enough, uh, that, that Barack Obama, despite some initial um, outreach, seemed to uh, in part encouraged by his party, decide there was nothing in it and he might as well just, like Clinton f decided uh, or in his first year, they just go it alone. Um, but think about the things that have been issues in this election, the stimulus. The stimulus bill, the first person to put on the map that we needed a big stimulus was none other than Martin Feldstein, the chairman of Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. On um, Halloween Day, I remember in the Washington Post, he wrote that we needed $300 billion in pure spending, no tax cuts. Nobody on the Democratic Party had said anything approaching that. And um, so by the time, the, then the economy is getting worse by the week. So by the time Democrats came in, they were looking at a, something on the scale of a trillion dollars, but they made one third of it tax cuts, in part because Barack Obama, I think many people have argued to me, made the mistake of of negotiating with himself, thinking that if I put these, instead of letting Republicans put the tax cuts in the stimulus, he put them in and then didn't want to go much further. They threw in the AMT relief for Chuck Grassley and a lot of good that did them. But um, then the health care bill. People talk about government takeover and how this was a, a liberal bill. Well, just ask the liberals how liberal it was. But I covered the 94 health care debate. The bill that passed is so similar to, well, you don't have to take my word for it. They'll tell you. Republicans in the Senate, Bob Dole, John Chafee, and 21 other Senate Republicans co-sponsored a bill that's practically with an individual mandate. That was their alternative to the Democrats' employer mandate. The Fiscal Commission. You have the McConnell 7, where Mitch McConnell and seven other uh, Republicans in the Senate who had once co-sponsored the idea of a fiscal commission voted against it when 
uh, it was um, the idea of the Democrats. And financial regulation, again, an arguably moderate bill, just ask the liberal Democrats, and one that, you know, I think there was some work in the Senate, uh, could have been more of involving Republicans, but um, I know from two Republican senators that when, on the banking committee, that when they thought they had a deal, they were called into Mitch McConnell's office and reined in. So I'm just, I just think that this has been a, a, uh, this, a period that sort of worries me for the future when I see the kind of decisions that the Fiscal Commission has illustrated by its package we're going to have to be making in the, um, in the next few years. And it's really, I just came from a, a briefing at the uh, residence of the Ambassador of the European Union and he was talking about, because there's going to be this summit in uh, Lisbon this weekend, and he was saying that <coughs> Europeans are very, very worried about the prospect for a dysfunctional uh, American government. And, um, and I think they should be and I think we should be. And it's just very difficult, though, to know, you know, when do you accommodate and when do you not. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, <laughs> Before I open up to the uh, floor, I want to give our uh, other earlier uh, panelists a chance to make comments on anything that has uh, been said after them. Uh, Congressman Walker? Well, let, 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 let right. questions. Fazio, did you have anything, any follow-up comments on anything that's gone before? I, I just wanted to make a comment on the dilatory tactics uh, that we've seen. We have saw the graphs up there. Uh, it, it is increasingly the minority's goal to make the majority inoperable, unable to function, not pass the appropriation bills, not just in time, but even during the year in which the fiscal year has begun. Um, and I think this is a trend that uh, is bipartisan and is terribly destructive. It isn't that people are offering uh, amendments uh, to make a shift in priorities within an appropriations bill. It's, it's amendments which amount to a filibuster, countless, almost repetitive amendments that cause the majority to say, we don't have the time to spend a week on the energy and water appropriations bill. And therefore, it gets rolled into an omnibus. There's no conference with the Senate anymore. All of the things that used to make this kind of legislating, uh, I think, an important success for the Congress has been sort of put out of uh, uh, the realm of reason, and largely because I think minorities conclude that the most important thing they can do is make sure that the majority fails, capital F, broadly. And, and that becomes more important than whether or not they uh, actually accommodate the minority in any concept of uh, amendments or changes to law. And I think this is really sort of escalation of what we used to see. And it is, re I think, reminiscent of an era that we're in where polarization is so deep in the country and uh, so much a part of our media, cable, the blogosphere, that uh, it's really what the two-party basis, Jackie was talking about the computer-driven redistricting. We may see some changes. California has a commission now for Congress. Florida has passed a constitutional amendment that might change this uh, by requiring districts to have a little bit more integrity based on population and cities and counties. But the bottom line here is the polarization that we now see in the Congress has led us to a point where this is the norm. Make sure the majority fails. It's not so important as to what you have to offer as much as that they don't succeed. I think that's a very troubling change. That. I've seen in, in uh, the last 10 years. If I might, though, mm -hmm. the, the, the antidote to that, though, is to, <clears throat> is to allow free and open debate in the Congress. I mean, I think where the mistake has been made by both parties is when they shut down free and open debate, allowed germane amendments to come to the floor. I'd say to, uh, I'd say to Jackie on her point about the health care bill, the financial reg bill, and so on, these are all written in back rooms. The Republicans had absolutely no input to them whatsoever, none. And so, and then they bring them to the floor under an absolutely closed process, and and, and expect their, and people expect the Republicans to just say, okay, fine, that the, it's the country needs it. Uh, what you need to do is bring these bills to the floor, 
and allow them to be debated, allow people to bring amendments. That's what forces the, the minority to come up with alternatives at, at that point. They don't have to come up with any alternatives if all you're asking them to do is vote up or down on the bill. Uh, but if you put uh, a bill out there, they have to come up with, with their solutions. They have to allow for amendments that, that uh, put them on the line uh, for what they stand for. And uh, I, I think when the Republicans shut down the process on the Democrats, when the Democrats, you know, over the last two years, only one bill was permitted on the floor under a modified open rule, not under a real open rule, under a modified open rule, uh, one bill was, was, was brought to the floor in the last two years. Uh, and um, uh, it was a fairly minor science uh, committee bill. Now, you know, that just is not legislating, and it certainly is not the way in which you assure uh, a, uh, an adequate policy process. Let me just uh, follow up on what Congressman Fazio has said, though. Uh, the appropriations process really was shut down completely this year before, I mean, there were only two bills that got to the floor and were adopted, and those were under restrictive rules, which was done to, I think, prevent this, uh, you know, the type of filibuster by amendment that you're worried about. But the, the fear, I, I understand, is that once you put these out there, they are so filled with earmarks, and there are people that want to get a vote on every one of those, and that could go on and on and on. But the majority does have the ability to restrict those, and they had done that in the past, but now they're, they, you know, we're not even willing to do that. Uh, is that what you saw unfolding? Well, I think what I've seen is a breakdown uh, of the committee leadership working across the aisle with the ranking re Republican in this case. I think we've seen the end of the ability of the majority and minority on each subcommittee to work together to get their bill. And we've seen the end of the kind of discussions that uh, routinely took place between the leaders of the speaker, the leader of the minority. You know, they would, they would in effect, uh, orchestrate <clears throat> what was needed to get comedy on the floor. We would get so many amendments for the minority on so many subjects, and that would be what allowed the process to work. The communication at all these three levels has broken down to a point where people can't even sit in the same room and agree on how they might proceed on some of the least partisan bills. But the bills aren't even being written in committee anymore. There, there, there's, no, there's no ability for the committees to, to work to, uh, in that fashion because the bills aren't even written in committee anymore. They're written in leadership offices and, and, and brought to the floor. And the only people who participate in that is maybe some of the majority members of the committee are brought in to the process, but there is certainly nobody from the minority there that uh, is permitted to have a say in what the legislation looks like. And uh, that is going to lead to a revolt immediately by, by the minority. We didn't have any input. Why should we be for anything uh, that, that's in this bill? And, and, and my suggestion is that, that the way in which you get around some of the intense partisanship uh, is to allow everybody to have their say. And, and, and allow uh, a real policy making to, to take place. And if it takes two or three weeks on the floor, so it takes two or three weeks. I mean, sometimes you might have to keep the House in session for, for um, uh, 18 hours a day in order to get through this and just tire the members out. But ultimately, you will have a better product if the House actually gets a chance to work its will. I, I don't disagree with that, but I would say that the task force approach to writing laws was really part of the Newt Gingrich genius, breaking down the committee uh, making sure the chairman no longer held sway. And certainly the two or three day week, which has become very hard to change, was embedded during that same period when everybody was uh, warned about going Washington. Live at home and make sure you don't spend any time there getting to know the other guy. Well, that was a West Coast thing. On the East Coast, we'd had the Tuesday, Thursday club for as long as I've, uh, and, uh, I've been around on <laughs> right. staff and in member, you, you with members. Very so. much closer than I <laughs> That's right. Anybody else, uh, Matthew or Jackie? Well, in that case, uh, let's uh, open it up to the audience. Uh, please wait to, for a microphone and then give your name and affiliation. So let's start up here uh, with the Tom Fahey. Oh, I gave away your name already. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Don. Um, Two-part question. Congressman Fazio, uh, so based on your comments, is the word bipartisanship merely a pipe dream? Um, I think it's going to be, in this period of economic distress in our country, a very important thing that I hope will prevail on some occasions. I think it's going to be a very rare occasion, but maybe essential. 
I'm afraid that we have come a long way from bipartisan relationships, let alone ability to work together and accomplish things together. And for Congressman Walker, um, Mr. Boehner has said, uh, Congressman Boehner has said um, that he's going to return the power to the chairman. That the committees are now going to have the power. So does this mean that someone's going to be an adult? And is this what we're going to go back to? Is Mr. Boehner going to be going back to taking up what you just spoke about to say, you're going to go back to the committees, you're going to do the laws there? Well, he has certainly um, uh, said that. He has certainly said that he's going to open up the process. He's on the floor. Uh, I hope he means it. He's a former committee well, chairman himself. Uh, he has seen that process work. Um, uh, for John Boehner and George Miller to actually work together on, uh, on legislation is uh, somewhat of, of an example of the, the fact that bipartisanship can work even and Kennedy too, yeah, yeah, even, yeah, yeah. even even in uh, uh, very very different uh, philosophical bases and with very activist members. And so uh, the committees are the place where you can hammer out um, uh, some of this um, uh, in, intensely uh, partisan. Um, a debate, and then uh, uh, maybe come up with uh, some compromise bills. And so I, I think John means that uh, absolutely, uh, and um, uh, I think that uh, the Congress will be better for it. Man, can I also just add, uh, I believe that Mr. Boehner, when he becomes Speaker, will be the first uh, Speaker of the House since the 1970s to have served both in the majority and the minority in the House twice. So perhaps this will further reinforce the, the idea that majority today equals minority tomorrow, so it's best to maybe be a little fairer to the, to the minority for that reason. I do think John is a much more institutional leader than uh, we've seen in recent Republican leaders in that he has been a part of bipartisan compromise. I will say, however, it's usually when he's had a Republican president, and now it will be interesting to see if he can be as bipartisan when he has a Democratic president. Okay, other questions? Let's bring the microphone over here to Monty Tripp. Hi, I'm Monty Tripp with Wexler and Walker. Uh, under President Reagan, when you had a Republican Senate and a Democratic House majority, the Republican House minority was essentially left out of all negotiations. They, they were, they were non-existent. Do we anticipate that same kind of triangulation under a uh, Democratic president with a Democratic Senate and a Republican House majority. You mean, will Obama stiff Nancy Pelosi? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> Any uh, guesstimates? <laughs> there was, there'll be some tough times. <laughs> I mean, I, I think if, if you really knew the relationship that Rahm Emanuel and, and Nancy had developed, and the fact that they had some tough times in the first two years, I think you can only imagine how difficult it will be when their uh, political interests may, may differ. I think I've always assumed that the, the party in power needs to govern to be reconfirmed in power. They need to be able to show accomplishment. And that's certainly in Obama's interest. And everybody knows with this volatility he could well be elected in two years, even after this debacle. On the other hand, it's not always uh, in the interests of the certainly minority Democrats in the House to buy into every compromise that, uh, that he wants to engage in. In some cases, they would be better off politically drawing the bright line, just as uh, John Boehner has in the last two years. Yeah, I think that's true. And, it, and the question will be whether or not, given the circumstances that they have, whether or not they really want to be spear carriers for the administration. Uh, in the Congress. They don't have the votes to accomplish it. Uh, and so uh, the question will be whether or not that's the role they want to play or whether or not they want to uh, play the role of uh, defining themselves as being against that which the Republicans are, are attempting to do uh, and uh, leave it up to the, to the administration uh, to veto the things that they can't accomplish in, in, in the House. I mean, he, he really needs to get back the independence. That's job one. But at the same time, he cannot, he, he has to do something to um, <clears throat> get back the excitement of the yes. base. Now, I think one thing the White House is counting on, one thing I know they're counting on, and it's not a bad bet, 
is that the Republicans will govern in the House in a way uh, that excites the base for them uh, to get, you know, there's nothing, what's the old saying in politics, that there's nothing that motivates voters like uh, anger and fear, and, and uh, both of those things, you know, could be emotions that come into play as they watch uh, House Republicans, depending on how they govern. Okay. Other questions in the back? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Jeff Biggs. I know this is a focus on the House, <clears throat> but for a moment, if we look at the Senate, since Senator Dole's name has come up, among the many things he was famous for was being willing to sit down at a table and negotiate on the theory that he would rather leave with half a loaf than no loaf. Now you get the sense, if we talk about the Republicans not having too much input into the House bill on health care, you certainly could not say that about the Senate bill. And yet compromise at this point in time seems to be making concessions but not, but not getting any support. Now, is that, in fact, where compromise is headed, where you are still going to preserve the issue at the expense of the legislation? Well, if, if I could just jump in quickly, because that gives me an opportunity to say to Bob that when he took issue with what I said about um, compromise, he was speaking to the House. I probably got too far afield, was talking about the Senate when I was dealing with the stimulus and the health care reform bill. Those were, I was thinking about the activities and months and months of it to get Republican votes in the Senate. Um, I think it's, I don't know how, whether it's House Republicans or Senate Republicans uh, are going to want to compromise. I think a lot of the people that were elected, they, are, they don't have that in, inclination. Um, they don't see grounds for compromise, but those Republicans whom I know uh, want to do, you know, cut deals are, they're look all you, you say two words to them, Bob Bennett and who lost his seat in the Republican convention in Utah, he had for two sins. One was voting for TARP, put forward by a Republican president and Treasury Secretary, but the other was simply co-sponsoring a health care overhaul with um, Ron Wyden of Oregon. Um, and, and then you can, you can look down the list of others and see what was said about, you know, Mike Castle and others who similarly, Lisa Murkowski, she'll be back, but, you know, look what it took. Um, and anyway, I just think that it's it's simply enough. I've talked to so many Tea Party members, and they just don't want to see compromise. And, and granted, they they're not totally in charge, but they, I think they're an oversized influence over the Republican Party right now. But let's but but let's remember. I mean, when we're talking about the, the work that was done in the Senate, basically what the Democrats did was the administration tried to pick off two or three Republicans. Uh, you know, they worked they worked with them and tried to bring them in. There was not much of an effort made to try to work with the totality of the Republican uh, caucus where the philosophical issues would come to mind. What they did was picked out three or four uh, uh, Republicans that they thought shared closest to their philosophical um, base uh, and, and tried to work with them. That's not the kind of compromise that, that ends up uh, being true bipartisanship. All, all you've done then is made those people pariahs inside their own party uh, for uh, for having gone uh, with the Democrats. The, the, the real bipartisanship that has to be demonstrated here is a bipartisanship that understands that the Republicans come from a, uh, from a philosophical base and begin to work with them uh, on, uh, on the basis of, of the reality of their positions, uh, and not simply trying to pick off one or two so that you get enough votes to get over 60. But the great irony is that that process actually helped the Republicans because it prolonged the the period. It made the process ugly. It gave months and months of opportunity to go on national television saying they're cutting your Medicare, which frankly uh, it created the atmosphere in which the Democrats couldn't succeed. Well, I agree with that. Yeah. No, I agree, I agree with that. I think it was a very bad strategy for, 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 for the administration to have uh, pursued it uh, that way. Uh, but the, you know, again, I come back to the, the right strategy is to allow real bipartisan activity uh, to take place, and that's what happens most often in the committee structure uh, rather than uh, in, a, in a general kind of leadership-led uh, uh, effort. Okay, other questions? Yes, over here. 
Hi, I'm Paula Felt with the uh, Dispute Resolution Service at FERC. We need you, Paula. I mean, that's what I was wondering about, um, the use of mediation in the committee process, that um, if you had neutrals come in and you had them work with both parties and you, you know, looked beyond positions and looked at interests and looked at what could really help the national, you know, seeing the national, you know, come up with really concrete national policies, and, you know, it would be a collaborative effort as opposed to, you know, the Demo Democrats say this, Republicans say that. I mean, what would be so bad about that? And actually having the new freshmen that come in have conflict resolution training. You could have people from Pepperdine. You could have people from Georgetown who would love to come and, and teach these skills to these people who, you know, it's their nature to be confrontational in these, you know, these campaigns, they, they've just come off these campaign trails, are so confrontational, why not try to, you know, give them these skills so they can maybe move forward and get something done instead of having this gridlock? Well, Congressman Walker is from the Science Committee, so I think he has looked at various things of that sort. Uh, do they work in politics? Do they work in Congress as far as uh, any right. kind of uh, mediators to, to resolve disputes? Not very well. And, um, Why? And, and, well, part of it is because our constitutional system was designed as an adversarial system. I mean, uh, you, you, you have a constitutional system that, that created three separate branches of government, all of whom are adversarial. You have a Congress where the Senate and House hate each other. Now, you know, it's, a, it's an institutional hatred. It's not personal and so on. But they hate each other because they, they, they operate on, on very different planes and so on. And so you have that adversarial. You throw in philosophical differences that, that, that truly do exist in politics. And, and then uh, you, you put a layer of partisan differences on, on top of the philosophy. And it's very hard to say that, that you are going to have, uh, you know, conflict management uh, in, in that kind of, of situation. You know, it seems to me, uh, again, that the, the way in which you cool it off is to allow everybody to have their say. Um, you know, most people get the most frustrated if they, if they don't have a chance to have their say. Uh, you know, because I used to operate, I, got, I lost a lot. Uh, you know, I offered a lot of amendments, I lost all the time and so on. But, but I, figured, I, figured I, had, I figured I had a chance to make my case and at some point Maybe somebody would, else would recognize the wisdom of that case. Didn't happen very often, but, uh, but at least I had my, uh, my, my shot at it, and my constituents had their voice. It, you know, the way in which you are going to get Congress back to a tradition that actually makes sense is when, uh, is when you get to a situation where you can, in fact, have a good debate on the floor. Um, Vic Fazio and I can, uh, can debate on the floor. We can have at each other. We can go down and have lunch together. And I can say to him, you've got to admit, I really got you on that last point. I really <laughs> did, you know, and so on. You know, and, and, and that's... More that's, often than not, you did. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the way, that's the, way the, the, the process um, uh, ultimately should work if you really do have a, a, a sense of true debate. Part of the problem is if you look at the polling coming out of the election, uh, overwhelming majority of Republicans want their member to stand firm and not compromise. Democrats, typically wishy-washy, uh, on the other hand, would like to see everyone come together and find common ground. Uh, that's not likely to produce the kind of accommodative environment where dispute resolution could work, in part because uh, the people who actually come to Congress are probably even more disposed to stand firm on both sides of the aisle than the people who elected them. I think the, the people who've come back as part of the incoming Republican class, Bob and I were talking about this earlier, heavily inexperienced in government of any sort. They know why they were nominated and they know why they were elected and they came, they're coming to town to accomplish something. And whether or not they can do that may have a lot to do with whether they come back. But certainly that's their MO right now. They're not about to compromise with people who they really don't like very much. And remember, the other thing to remember is you're dealing with 535 egomaniacs. Uh, you know, it takes a, a huge ego to get up one morning and decide that 700,000 people are prepared to send you to represent them in the Congress. And so you're dealing with, the, you know, it's, it's one of the great frustrations of leadership in the Congress is dealing with, uh, with, with that reality. But, I mean, uh, that also plays, plays a role in all of this. Didn't the moderates uh, at one point, uh, when they existed in Congress, play that dispute resolution role, that mediating role, finding some common ground? But there's, that's not there now that the parties do stand so much apart and, and, and different from each other. 
Well, it, it happens within a party caucuses. I know the Democrats, for example, mm -hmm. knew that abortion would be a terribly difficult issue to handle on a health care reform bill. And people were asked, people of goodwill on both sides of that issue, both in the party, were, were, were tasked with dealing this uh, problem to a resolution over a year and a half and couldn't get there with the complete support of the, say, in this case, pro-life community. Um, and it became a very significant issue in the elections or the decision to retire on the part of a number of pro-life Democrats who voted for this bill. I mean, who would have expected Jim Oberstar to be, to be defeated? In part, I think it was an issue like this, which uh, he'd been a pro-life Democrat his whole life. And this became a divisive issue. So, I mean, even when the parties internally try to resolve these issues, they're very, very hard to get a handle on. Can I just, can I just add, too, there, to think about things in terms of trade-offs. So, um, you know, for all the criticism, and, and many, many of it, much of it may be valid about the state of polarization in Congress today, um, we had, you know, several decades ago, uh, folks like moderates, as, you know, like Don Wolfensberger mentioned, moderate members and party leaders, whose goal was to try to uh, prevent those sorts of things. Um, but then, oftentimes, the criticism was the parties don't stand for anything. Right? You had uh, Democratic activists, Republican activists saying, what's going on here? You're a Republican, but you're voting with Democrats. You know, I want to know what party you stand for and where you're going. So now we have these alternatives, right? This was mentioned earlier, almost like a parliamentary system. So now you have choices. So you don't have that problem. But now there's a concern about lack of comedy and lack of agreement. So it may be impossible to achieve all the things that we want, but to remember that if we want to go back to a system in which there was maybe more cross-party agreement or less criticism, that then you may lose something in the process. Yeah, if I get back to Thomas Brackett Reed, <clears throat> back in the 1890s, I quote him in my uh, introductory essay, in, which is in your handout, but he uh, did not care for the minority very much, even when he was in the minority, because he saw it as obstructing everything, and he thought the majority should be able to work its will at the end of the day. And so he used a line that uh, was often quoted to, when I worked for Jerry Solomon, a Republican on the Rules Committee, Joe Moakley was the chairman, the Democratic chairman, but he loved to dig up Reed quotes, because Reed had minimal high regard for the minority. And so Joe Moakley would often say, well, according to your former speaker, Thomas Reed, <laughs> the only right of the minority is to draw it pay, its only duty is to make a quorum. And of course Solomon would just get a little riled at that, but uh, that was sort of the attitude towards the minority back when you had another era of, of party governance uh, in, the, in the Congress. Other questions? Tom, before you, let's see if there's uh, some, this gentleman, did you have your hand up? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Hi, Dave Rabinowitz. I was wondering if any of you would be willing to prognosticate on the Tea Party. Are they going to be Republicans, or are they going to be another minority party? Where's the Tea Party movement going as far as, let's say, let's start with its influence in Congress, and then uh, maybe you could speculate as to bro its broader uh, influence beyond that. But Look, in my opinion, the Tea Party people have been around for a long, long time. Back in Nixon's time, they were called the Silent Majority. Uh, they then became the Reagan Democrats, they then became the Perot, the Perot Movement, they then became the Republican Revolution, they then became, uh, you know, uh, the uh, people who voted for Obama. I mean, there are a lot of independents who have had a similar feeling about the, the, the debt and deficit of the country over a, over a long, long period of time, and they've expressed it in a variety of ways and so on, but they have never uh, really organized themselves in, into a separate party. The interesting thing about the Tea Party, in my view, and it, and, and it may be definitional of the politics of the future, is that it really doesn't exist as a real defined movement. It is a series of activists who have their own issue agenda who are organized virtually through the Internet. Uh, and uh, it allows them to communicate with each other. It allows them to, to act in, in, a, in common fold. But they, they really are not uh, organized under a particular leadership. In order for them to move into a political party status at some point in the future, they would have to unite around some kind of a, of a leadership model, and I don't know that they're prepared to do that. Now, it could be if the Republicans totally fail in, in doing what they have said that they are going to do in the Congress, uh, that, they, that there will be uh, leadership develop that will try to take the Tea Party 
um, uh, in the direction uh, of a third party movement. Uh, <coughs> but I think we have to wait and see uh, uh, what the performance of the Republicans is. And the Republicans recognize that they, the Tea Party has given them kind of a second chance, uh, but it's not just a second chance, it's, it's, it's perhaps their only chance. Yeah, they were not very happy with George W. Bush. They didn't like TARP, certainly. They certainly weren't happy about Republican Congresses increasing earmarks and spending. They certainly uh, probably didn't like paying for the drug benefit off the books or paying for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq off the books. But they really weren't energized until the economy came along and knocked their housing values down, made their uh, employment uncertain, cut their 401ks. <coughs> Those were threatening things, and they needed to then get off the bench and get into the game on behalf of someone who spoke up about debt and deficit. After all the debt and deficit we'd added from the early, you know, the, from the Clinton budgets that were balanced. But the, the real question, I think, is who's going to pick up their cudgel for president? I mean, I think their members will fight uh, some very visible battles in Congress to try to reaffirm the support they've had from this group. But who will be their presidential candidate, because if they get someone who they're not enamored with, they could support a third party, I think. Perot certainly had a third party, so that movement did develop into a party movement. Can I just add one thing, too, on that? Also, uh, Congressman Walker's point is very well taken. In fact, I would go even further back than that. I'd go back at least as far as the Liberty League against FDR, which was uh, folks who opposed the New Deal for some of the similar arguments about the Constitution, concern about the budget. Uh, the differences between then and now are several fold. One is that the Liberty League was a top-down organization, whereas, as you, you noted, uh, the Tea Party is more bottom-up, which in some ways has given them more flexibility. Uh, also, a second thing is that FDR and Democrats were much more skillful and much more aggressive in trying to neutralize the Liberty League, uh, which made them less effective and influential in the, the midterm elections of 1934. And also, the economic crisis, of course, was far, far greater. Uh, so there was a Senate Republican senator after the 1934 midterms when the Democrats uh, actually won seats, which was unusual in a midterm, uh, and the senator said, you know, we all thought about the Constitution, how important it is, but people can't eat the Constitution. Uh, so those kinds of differences, I think, make the Tea Party more uh, influential. But I think it's important to think about what their influence actually is. Um, you know, as, as Jackie Combs mentioned, exit polls are sort of all over the map. So it's not clear that they, uh, you know, turned out in great numbers and that led to this election. I think at least their, their influence is at least as much in who they nominated. Uh, and, and those candidates who have said they need to, to either align themselves or claim they're aligned with the Tea Party, in that respect, their influence could be far greater because these members feel personally they're connected with the movement and that their behavior uh, will be watched by those, those groups. And so in that respect, they, they could have some influence. But yeah, it's probably a little early to say exactly what's going to happen uh, in the coming uh, months. Jackie, do you have anything to add? Okay. Um, no, but I was thinking, as, as several uh, people commented, I've thought that in terms of this polarization, uh, as the journalist here, I'm, I, I am feeling lately the extent to which the changes in journalism as its practice have um, reinforced the polarization and, and to the extent that you have, um, you know, when, when you have this almost quasi-parliamentary form of government and each side is dedicated to seeing the other side fail, a lot of things get said on both sides that, you know, are, are uh, more rhetoric than reality, and, it, and, uh, and yet you have the media outlets that more and more people are going to. They're like boutiques where the people go, you know, to the media outlet that most tells, says to them what they are, you know, that reinforces their own biases. <coughs> um, and I think that's very dangerous, and meanwhile, all over the country, newspapers uh, are, you know, in financial straits and, and haven't figured out how to make money off of the internet advertising yet and, um, and are losing subscribers because people just are not interested and, and, and don't even trust that, I mean, they would disagree with my premise that it is even a balanced sort of reporting. Um, and uh, so I, I, it's, it's, we're all in this together. Yet when we started out as a nation, uh, the Jefferson Party had their own paid newspapers right, that's and the what I... Federalists had their own paid news newspapers, and right. that's right. kind of yep. how things started out. Yep. This gentleman back here had a question. The Alien and Sedition Act. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi, Mark Olasak of the Congressional Fellowship in Albright College. Can you draw some parallels between the recent election and what happened in the 70s when you had the, the programmatic liberals come in and essentially split the Democratic Party? What are the prospects of that on the GOP side this time around? Uh, do you see the Tea Party pulling Boehner um, and, well, not the folks behind him, Cantor, I think, would go that direction. Uh, do, you, do you see them uh, splitting the Republican Party and maybe giving rise to more moderates, uh, either on the Republican side, which would be great, or on the Democratic side? Well, I mean, I think that um, um, in the initial phases here, the, the Republican leadership is doing a pretty good job of, um, uh, of pulling together um, uh, the majority. I mean, uh, the, the, they've got 84 new members to work with, a lot of whom came out of, uh, of activist movements and so on. And, and part of the genius of this will be sitting down and trying to uh, figure out uh, what the agenda looks like and, and not to over uh, analyze what your mandate is. I mean, to some extent, uh, in 1994, what happened to us is a little bit of hubris set in about uh, what our agenda really was and really meant. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, I think the health care bill for many, many people out there was in fact a, uh, a proxy for debt and deficit. That there's no doubt that this particular um, um, majority has a mandate on, on government spending and, and, and big government. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. How they interpret that will depend then on how they are able to hold together uh, that caucus. I think the other way in which they'll hold together the caucus is by, is by going to the committees and allowing a lot of these people to work through these issues as a part of their committee assignments. That that also will tend to weld it uh, together. Um, and, um, um, you know, so far it appears to me as though they're off to a pretty good start. Larry Altman at Wilson Center. Uh, to what extent uh, do the lobbyists play into this in terms of, uh, for the members of uh, Senate and Congress, not having time to talk to each other and have lunch with each other because they have to spend so much time uh, <coughs> soliciting funds and getting reelected? So is there a large factor from the lobbyists that uh, exaggerates what might have happened in past years? It's a very good question. You have two people here from the other side now. The dark side. <laughs> <laughs> Not the dark side. <laughs> First of all, I'd say as a lobbyist, um, you don't see a lot of members these days. Members are busy calling you for money, along with a lot of other people who aren't lobbyists. But <clears throat> you don't have a lot of time when you're only in town a couple of days to sit down with lobbyists. They talk to your staff if uh, they're fortunate enough to get in the door. Um, but money has become a huge factor in how they spend their time and what they do. And I'm personally supportive of legislation that I know comes from sort of the left perspective, but it would allow for matching funds, small donations that can be parlayed into larger public funds. Uh, you, you would therefore have to show real support in your community, your district, your state to get into the game, so it's not a, a free ride for fringe candidates. But it is a long way from enactment, and it may not even be something that this court would accept. Uh, so I don't see practically any alternative but to keep going down this road, which is to say that members of Congress spend far more now than ever before, a growing amount of time, simply raising funds for the next you know, wave election. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with that. I think the fundraising <laughs> has become obscene, uh, and um, uh, and I and, and I would reject your idea that uh, that you uh, force it off on the lobbying community and so on. I think all of us, I think all of us are are, are concerned about uh, the way in which money has um, uh, tended to take uh, the um, uh, the real. Uh, intellectual ferment out of uh, out of the process. I mean, most of us would like to be talking about issues on the on the basis of the merits of the issue, and not on the basis of uh, of fundraising. And um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the uh, contacts that uh, people have in this town with members of Congress um, are at fundraising events these days. Uh, I, I regret that. I think that that's a, I think that's very bad. 
If I could have my way, uh, I would um, uh, ban lobbyists from uh, giving any money to uh, candidates and thereby assure that uh, the, the lobbying was done uh, on the basis of, uh, of putting uh, the, uh, uh, the, the subject matter before them and rather than, uh, uh, rather than having the, the money. I would also, um, uh, my, my reform of the type Vic talks about, uh, my reform would be to uh, uh, not allow any candidate to have a fundraising committee, anybody running for office. Uh, have, them, uh, have the political parties raise all the money and apportion the money out to, out to their candidates uh, and keep the uh, fundraising one step removed from the policymaking process. Uh, you know, uh, you know there, there are some things that you could look at doing uh, that it seems to me would, uh, would make uh, some sense. If I could just add very quickly, uh, if your concern is about members who don't have enough time to interact with each other and, and work together, certainly fun, spending time fundraising can be a problem, but I would argue this goes back before the rise of political action committees and massive amounts of money in, in campaigns. It goes back at least to the 19, early, mid-1970s where you had new members getting elected who weren't as interested in interacting with others and saw themselves more as needing to focus on their district. So this, uh, as Congressman Walker mentioned, the Tuesday Thursday Club spreading outward from New England to other states. And things like the House eliminating uh, the quorum call, where it used to be members would uh, say, I asked for a quorum. You have 15 minutes, members would come to the floor. And it, there was no vote, but it was an opportunity to meet and talk with other people on the floor. Uh, there are some substitutes to that now on the House floor, but you don't see the floor as a place for members to sit and interact and talk with each other as it used to be. And I think that's a loss as far as an opportunity for members to get to know each other across the aisle. I wouldn't want to make just one additional comment here uh, relating to spouses. Certainly as it, as it relates to lobby reform, our spouses are even more for these reforms. Than Bob <laughs> <laughs> but the, the other factor on spouses, you know, people don't think about the reality of pulling out of Keokuk, Iowa and moving to Washington because it isn't just taking Johnny out of high school. The spouse is often employed. That's the reality of modern housing costs to worker families. You just don't pull someone out of a career, male or female, and move them to Washington. That doesn't work very well. So there are lots of cultural factors, jet aircraft, Blackberries and cell phones. Everything is sped up, and people are just constantly connecting and yet not really dealing with each other as human beings in Washington, which I think is at the root of a lot of this inability to work together. Let me follow that up because if, you, if, mem if we agree that lobbyists don't like to have to be asked for money and members really don't like to raise it, Members do like to go back to their districts, though, but is, is Boehner's idea of spending more time legislating in committees, is that realistic? Are members going to push back saying, well, I'm sorry, but I've got to really spend more time back home, or I still have to raise the money for my campaign? Is it realistic to think that members want to be legislators again? That's going to be a very heavy lift. I mean, I've been in the leadership rooms where we, where we sat and listened to people who told us that, you know, unless you have real legislation to schedule on the floor, I don't want to be in town, let me get home to my district, um, you know, that's, that will be a very, very heavy lift uh, for, the, for the leadership uh, to keep members in town long enough for them to actually uh, participate in real uh, substantive uh, committee activity. And uh, uh, that's, that's, a, that's an open question. You know, why did the Democrats leave town early this year? They wanted face time with their constituents. They knew that might begin to heal some of the division. It may have worked in some cases, certainly not in many. But the point is, uh, more and more members, particularly when they're getting a blast, a hot blast from the district, if they really are good and understand how they can mitigate that, they want to be there. Whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, they want to be there. Well, this will be the test that we're going to see uh, unfold in the next Congress. And before I... Uh, uh, ask you all to join us for a reception to thank our panelists. I am going to inflict my little poem on you. Um, <laughs> my ode to Jefferson's manual. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson, as the Senate's president, foresaw conflict with amazing prescience. He studied hard the British precedents and compiled a manual to quell the messiness. <laughs> with that, please join me in thanking our panel.